now more than ever, you need technology you can rely on. I'm a Dell Technologies advisor. Ich auch. And if you're a small business, we're with you. We are with you. Estamos com você. We want to help. So we'll be right here. At home. Answering your calls. Providing support. And standing by you. Every step of the way. Tina Shop by Kaday leads Russell Reynolds Associates Global Diversity and Inclusion Advisory Services as a senior member of the leadership and succession team. She's focused on the recruitment of chief diversity officers, the development of inclusive leaders, and inclusive culture transformation. Based in San Francisco, she advises public, private, and nonprofit clients around the world. Tina has 25 years of industry experience. Prior to RRA, she held various senior roles, advising clients on managing a diverse workforce. Tina started her career at McKinsey and Company, also CEO of Zbox Company, a venture-backed company whose product line was later acquired by Whirlpool. Tina earned a BS in Commerce with honors from the University of Virginia and an MBA from the Stanford Graduate School of Business. Tina was formerly a charter member of Thai and has founded a number of key organizations benefiting a large Indian particularly women leaders. Tina, such a great pleasure to have you on board here. Thank you so much, Radhika. Um, really just a pleasure to be here and appreciate your generous introduction. Um, you know, we're talking here on a topic that uh, diversity, equity, inclusion is not only at the core of my work, but it's been near and dear to my heart for as long as I can remember. Um, as you mentioned, I've been involved in the Indian community for a very long time, uh, first founding the network of Indian professionals here in the Bay Area, and then serving as the first um, chair of the National Board of Directors back in the 90s. And I look, when I look back, I recall that our keynote for the TICON event in September in Dharnui was our keynote for that conference back in New York in 1998. Um, and looking forward to reconnecting the dots there. I um, became involved in Thai in the late 90s through the venture-backed consumer technology company that you mentioned that I ran as CEO. And what I didn't realize at that time was that I was one of the few women founders to receive venture funding. Um, that number, I think, is still hovering around 7%, hopefully inching up steadily um, as we look at the numbers and try to make progress. And just a real pleasure to continue to be involved um, in Thai to increase the participation of women founders um, and also other people of diverse backgrounds. So thank you again. Um, and I don't know if you're able to share the yes. presentation. So I will um, share screen. Thank yeah. you. And you know, as, as we transition to this topic of diversity, equity, inclusion. Today, everybody is talking about DE&I for very different reasons. Um, diversity has always been the right thing to do, right, as proclaimed by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And now it's really a business imperative as well. Mm -hmm. um, after the May 25th murder of George Floyd, the vast majority of businesses have really focused on response to Black Lives Matter as we look at um, the S&P 500, which I'll talk about in just a moment. But, you know, the issue is not new in Silicon Valley. Women have long called for an end to bro culture where beer pongs, golf, and other issues have long plagued some of our companies. Um, a coalition of Fortune 500 companies have pledged to reduce bias and create a common understanding. And BlackRock and other asset management firms have demanded that boards diversify among other diversity demands for large companies that they're investing in. And just looking further back, right, as we think about, you know, whether it's Dr. Martin Luther King or Mahatma Gandhi, they both lost their lives fighting for civil rights in the U.S. and in India. And I'm, you know, really proud to be a product of both of these cultures. Um, you know, my parents immigrated to this country from India in the early 70s for their education. And they came here with the, um, you know, $8 in their pocket, like many immigrants coming for education and have lived the American dream of entrepreneurship um, and sent two daughters off to be fellow entrepreneurs in the U.S. in my case, as I run and scale the DE&I practice at Russell Reynolds and in Mumbai in the case of my sister. 
And it's really this Thai ecosystem that's critical, right, to women like us who benefit from the support of sponsors in the community, whether it's Lata Krishna and Vish Mishra and many others. But that's not really enough. You know, we also need sponsors from the majority to advocate and to support us. Um, so we were just talking about, you know, the, the motivation for DEI has been, you know, both driven for moral reasons and for business reasons. And we recently conducted an analysis of the response to the recent murders of George Floyd and others um, by CEOs of S&P 500 companies. And as we looked at those companies, what we found is that 75% of the sample that we analyzed made some kind of statement denouncing racism and acknowledging recent victims of racial violence. But as we continue to look at other things that companies have done, um, the drop off to 30% is where companies have acknowledged that they have more work to do within their own walls. And so far, our analysis shows that only 5% have taken real action, right? So in two months, the question is, there's such a large response, what's holding us back and how can we make a difference? So as we look at Silicon Valley in particular and the statistics um, in the Valley, what we find is that while white men comprise 59% of the executive suite, they make up 39% of all professionals in Silicon Valley. And as we look at black professionals, Latinx employees, and Asians, the reverse is true. And so I'll point out for Asians that they make up 37% of the tech workforce in Silicon Valley, but only 21% of all executives. Um, you know, for Asians, it's largely a leaky pipeline issue. For Blacks and Latinos, it's both a STEM issue and a leaky pipeline issue. And for all parties, it's really just an expensive turnover issue because we work so hard to recruit diverse employees and they end up going through that revolving door, um, oftentimes because they feel like they don't belong within their organizations or they lack the kind of sponsorship that they need. And the question is, you know, what's, what's really going on behind these numbers? I spent the greater part of my professional career here in the Bay Area when I started my first job at McKinsey and Company in the early 90s. And I recall back then having conversations about white privilege and the fact that several folks that talked about this issue couldn't see the difference in social capital between people of color and people um, of the majority. And what's interesting about that is I'm still having that same conversation today in advising clients that the importance of sponsorship for those who have less social capital is really important so that we can make progress in changing those numbers. So let's look at the face of Silicon Valley, right? Um, not just recently, but over a period of time, these leaders have been very, very vocal about diversity and inclusion whether it's Microsoft's $150 million pledge or Google's commitment. And there are actually many diverse leaders at the helm of these tech giants, whether Sundar Bichai, Tim Cook, Satya Nadella, John Thompson, or Sheryl Sandberg. And I remember back in 2015 when Jesse Jackson came through the Valley with the Rainbow Coalition and stirred up the tech giants to finally release their diversity statistics. They did, and yet the demographic statistics of these companies has changed very little since then. So if we take a look at some of those numbers, what we'll find is if we look at the percentage of black employees within, within these companies, the dark blue bars are 2015 numbers and the green bars are the most recent numbers in 2020. So over a five year period, um, there's relatively flat growth in terms of the percentage of black employees. The consumer companies, Amazon and Apple, are ahead of the others, perhaps because, you know, 11% of Americans um, are black consumers. The others still remain in the single digits and have barely budged. And, you know, the question is, you know, why do we think that is? Do we not think that diversity and inclusion is important? You know, that's one philosophy, but I think as we look at Silicon Valley, we do recognize that diverse perspectives lead to better business outcomes and better innovation. Diverse teams provide increased perspective to solve really novel problems like the driverless car, the world's energy crisis, and enterprise cloud solutions. 
And, you know, these solutions can often be hard to find in the context of ambiguity, which we're often facing when we try to solve difficult problems in the context of scarce resources. And research has demonstrated yet that novel problems are better solved by teams with diverse functional, educational, tenure backgrounds because they have increased creativity, which often outweighs the conflict that's created by increased demographic diversity. And in fact, as we look at the research that was done by McKinsey, we find that gender diverse teams perform 15% better than their counterparts and ethnically diverse teams perform 35% better. So the question I would ask is if we all agree that diversity is better for innovation and better for business, what's the missing link, right? And I would say that it's probably two things. One, it's much easier to make decisions quickly and nimbly if we all think alike. And two, increasing diversity requires creating a culture of inclusion, which is a long-term process of change, different from short-term quarterly focus on returns. Let's look at each of these issues next. So as we think about decision-making by venture capitalists in the Valley, um, they often have cognitive bias in their decision making, like other executives. And what this graph shows is actually that if we look at their accuracy rate versus their confidence level, they tend to be overconfident um, in their decision making. And they're susceptible, just like anybody else, to information overload, ambiguity, and uncertainty. And the reality is that most venture capitalists um, reflect the diversity of entrepreneurs who are funded. So they're still mostly white and mostly male. And it's easier to make decisions with people who are like themselves because we have like similarity attraction bias. So part of the hypothesis is that these venture decisions could benefit from more diversity of thought or at least inclusion of other thoughts. The second um, issue that I think um, is investing in the long term to create a culture of inclusion. And I think creating that culture of inclusion is really critical today. You know, it became important during when the period when COVID-19 first hit to lean into the softer side of empathetic and vulnerable leadership. And then it became doubly important because the racial justice movement came and executives need to talk about race in the workplace um, and yet they're not accustomed to doing so. Um, so it remains important to harness the power of diversity that we work so hard to put around the table. And any business today really needs to think about these issues very critically. Taking action for lasting impact by learning the vernacular and the skills associated with inclusive leadership is important for all of the reasons listed here, right? As you think about employees who are on the front lines, they're more diverse and at higher risk. Those who are working from home are isolated and anxious while they bring their whole selves to work through video. Um, leaders need to help their teams by showing vulnerability and demonstrating empathy. Cultural fluency is really important to understand the unique experiences that employees are going through as they work from home and school from home and other issues that are arising. Um, and then finally, as we think about xenophobia entering bias systems, we need to be well prepared to talk about the potential for bias that is unintentional, but unintentional, but often sits within our systems. And yet, you know, while inclusive leadership is critically important, what we find is that there's a gap in inclusive leadership, even for those who are well-meaning. And, and so, you know, as, as we think about what are the solutions that can help to change the face of diversity in Silicon Valley, I think inclusive, inclusive leadership is really at the core of this. In my opinion, it's really the missing link. And it's the skill set with which to construct diverse teams and harness the power of that diversity by not only recruiting diverse team members, but also creating a safe space for them to belong and enable their advancement through sponsorship. We typically operate um, you know, at the top level of this model, and I'll talk you through it in just a minute, um, where we're able to construct diverse perspectives and leverage those differences for innovation to win. What we find right now is that there is a challenge in operating at the bottom of this competency model. And so I'll start there with awareness and clarity. And, you know, we are really hard pressed 
when it comes to talking about topics like race and privilege in the workplace. Um, and part of that is um, the ability to identify what the motivation is um, for talking and investing in diversity and inclusion, but also to understand, you know, what does privilege mean? When does it manifest itself? When do I have it? You know, I often talk about I have privilege in working in diversity and inclusion as a minority female. Um, and, you know, really owning that and acknowledging how that comes to play when others on my team might not have that same privilege. Um, and, and using that acumen around diversity, equity, and inclusion to foster an open dialogue in the workplace around the topic, right, so that others can open up and share their personal stories with each other and truly feel like they belong. And that's the interpersonal aspect of it. So taking the knowledge of it that might be inside of me and really applying it to conversations in the workplace. The second level of inclusive leadership is really about courageous accountability and what we typically know is unconscious bias, where a lot of companies have invested in awareness. And most of that awareness training is, has resulted in folks being aware of other people's biases. Um, what's really hard work is identifying our own biases, right, where our blind spots are and how we can go about mitigating those before we work on holding others accountable. And I often like to point out that unconscious bias is really only one part of inclusive leadership. There are three other main competencies that we feel, you know, is, are critically important for leaders to um, um, understand and exhibit behaviors associated with. The third level is empowering others, and that's really about reflecting with empathy. So truly understanding the diverse perspective of the people on one's team and being able to understand their individual motivations to develop with feedback and also to be able to effectively sponsor and mentor um, those diverse uh, team members in order for them to succeed in their careers. And then I already talked about the final level, which we spend a lot of time talking about in the Valley because innovation is so important. And this is really about being able to understand how to comprise teams, not only of demographic diversity, but also diversity of thinking in order to draw out those perspectives and get to the best answers that I talked about. Um, what I would say is that this skill is incredibly important because millennials are craving, right, especially in a state where we're minority majority, um, the feeling of wanting to belong in their workplace. And yet leaders are scared to talk because they don't know what to say or how to say it in a way that's productive. This skill set is really one that's needed um, in order to avoid town halls gone awry, backlash, white lash, and, and everything in between. Um, we need to be able to talk about privilege, to use the word black, to talk about equity. And it's this messy people area at the bottom of this pyramid where we need to, I think, invest time to move the needle. Um, it's the hard work that I'm doing with leaders today who are interested in not just making empty statements, but also in having long lasting impact on diversity, equity, and inclusion for the benefit of the business. And with that, Radhika, I'd be happy to take any questions um, about this topic. That was great, Tina. I uh, really appreciate all of the insights you've given us and, and the things that you're actively working on because it, it is very much about not just um, rhetoric and talk around things, but really laying the ground and implementing plans to take it forward and make these things an, an, a reality, which is really what we need. So I, 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 to that point, um, you talked about you know, inclusivity and the culture of inclusion um, that, that needs to be fostered. So I've got actually two um, questions on that, which is um, how can leaders improve in including people of color and women in senior leadership roles? We've seen those gaps as you point, as you showed in your, in your, in your graphs and in your statistics. So obviously there's work to be done, but what, concretely can be done and championed by leaders in their organizations to overcome that? I think one of the things that we see as we look at the executive level is that many women and minorities, when they've reached the C-suite, often are in functional roles. So human resources, marketing, finance, technology. And I think one of the biggest things that 
um, sponsors and mentors can do is to steer their mentees towards general management roles. I think as we think about board diversity, it's that general management experience that's valued. And of course, some of these other functional areas are highly valued in particular on specific committees. But I think that um, what we find again is this pooling, right, of women and ethnic minorities in the functional roles. And I think steering folks, right, towards more of a general management role is one concrete thing mm. that sponsors and mentors can do. And getting over some of these, those unconscious biases that you mentioned as well, because uh, promoting and hiring from within and really recognizing and offering equal opportunities to everybody on the team um, and not just the select few that you're comfortable or familiar with, like you pointed out, um, that probably would help too, uh, I would imagine. That's exactly right. And so I think, you know, we all have a tendency to um, have like similarity bias um, in terms of who we're attracted to. And I think just being aware that that can come to play and really figuring out ways in which, um, you know, some of the gem opportunities to work on high profile projects um, and take stretch roles are more equally distributed, right, towards all of those on the team. And I think part of that has to do with building relationships of trust, right? And so if we just naturally are inclined to build those relationships with people like us, um, you know, people from the minority often get left out. And so I think it's really recognizing that just investing in that relationship development across difference um, can really lead to some change. And it can be as basic as that, but it also requires right, being open to talking about one's own experience so that those from a minority background who might have something personal to share feel comfortable doing that because there's a safe space that's been created by that leader. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, creating that stage space, I, that's, that's a great way to put it, because um, I feel that, you know, a lot of the inclusive leadership traits and aspects that you, that you showed in your presentation, um, really come down to systematizing a lot of those things. And that leadership has to come from not only taking that stage, as you pointed out, but then driving initiatives that are very specific and focused to bridging those gaps, because otherwise discussing, I think that's really part of that raising awareness that you, that you mentioned and you talked about. Uh, raising awareness is critically important. We, we certainly heard that those of um, the audience who attended Shelley Archambault's um, uh, keynote this morning and fireside chat with Tui Vu, they talked about being open and talking about issues and talking about things out in the open and that awareness and free uh, communication, as you were also pointing out, fosters that culture. But then systematizing things, I would imagine, also play a role in terms of actual active, intentional implementation of these um, of these of this culture. Yeah, that's exactly right, right? And if you think about the time that it takes to change a culture, it's on average, you know, five to eight years. And so it's really a long-term investment. I think what a lot of companies have done is stand, they stand up short-term programs that feel more like Band-Aids and expect to see the kinds of results and they don't see them in the long-term. And so keeping that time horizon in mind is critically important. I would say that um, the other thing that I see companies doing well when they actually are able to shift the culture is they think about the fact that leaders and their behaviors will have the most ripple effect in the organization. So while it's important to have employee resource groups and really addressing um, solutions from the bottom up in a grassroots fashion, it's also really important for leadership to exhibit the behaviors so that they um, will influence others in actually taking the risk that's required sometimes to give people a chance who they may not know as well. So I'd say that in the final thing that, um, you know, involves systemization is really embedding diversity and inclusion into people leader metrics. And the companies that have done this really well, right, they, they measure inclusion, which could be an otherwise nebulous concept, in addition to diversity, and those goals are embedded into the annual people leader goals, just like any other business metric that you would measure. 
So when you're talking about measuring um, diversity and inclusion, can you share some uh, pointers on what are some effective methods of doing that? Because as we all know, not all companies are actually measuring this very important metric. Absolutely. So, you know, one of the things that um, we do with many of our clients is to in employ an in um, inclusion index survey. And, you know, there are many different surveys available, but that survey really gives, you know, a quantitative read on what the climate of inclusion is, how it might compare to an external benchmark of companies that are either in your industry or best practice. Um, and then, in addition to that provides kind of the internal view of how does it differ for demographic groups, right? We're going through a process of having conducted inclusion index surveys over many years in many industries and companies to analyze um, the relationship, right, between race, gender, and level of belonging within an organization. And typically what we see at an organization level, right, is that there is a wide divide between men and women, people of diverse backgrounds, LGBTQ employees um, versus the majority counterparts in their ability to feel like they can belong um, within their climates. And we define that, right, as bringing your authentic self to work and really being your true self so that you can um, lead with authenticity. Mm -hmm. That's very, very true. Um, I'll shift the question slightly towards the VC um, arena. Um, you know, we talked about the dismal rate of funding, for example, for female founders, 7%, which is really dismal when you think about where we are in the 21st century. What can VCs do to change that um, actively? And I know that the, the subject of uh, female partners at VC firms has become a really great topic of discussion and many women uh, partners have been promoted to those ranks, etc. Um, and that certainly is going to alleviate things in the future. But is there anything else concrete and, and active that uh, VC firms can do to combat this uh, unconscious bias that you talked about, this investing in what's familiar? And let's face it, most of the VCs out there are white and male. I mean, I think there are a few strategies to think about. If you look at all of the research on venture investing, you'll see that um, those venture teams who are comprised of whether it's educational diversity or functional diversity tend to have the best outcomes. And those who are like each other, so for example, those who all have um, you know, science and humanities backgrounds are more likely to go IPO and those who have um, MBAs and legal backgrounds are less likely to go bankrupt. Well, if you think about how to comprise the team so you, you put everyone onto the single team, um, you're more likely to go IPO and you're less likely to bankrupt. And I think just acknowledging that you know, while it might be easier to make decisions quickly, um, if we all think alike, that group think um, is less likely to lead to differentiated outcomes. And so I think it's really thinking about it from that lens, but also then to say that, you know, there are opportunities, you know, whether it's consumer or B2B, that um, people of color or women might understand better in terms of the market place for it and to leverage diversity as an asset in terms of the investments that they're thinking about making investments in, given that, uh, you know, consumers in this state minorities are um, sorry, women in, in this state minorities are 50% of the population. Right. I, and, you know, I look forward to the time when uh, people talk about more lanes on the highway for people of color, for women, uh, for just diverse uh, founders in general. I would uh, promote that we need wider lanes on the highway because uh, the studies have also shown that people of color or diverse uh, backgrounds don't raise as much. So they might raise, but they might not raise as much as their white uh, male counterparts. And so uh, I think there's that hurdle as well that we're all working on is saying we need more funds uh, that do recognize the importance of investing in everybody, regardless of your background, but also offering the same opportunities and breadth of opportunity that um, white male founders might experience uh, currently. I mean, what's interesting to look at in terms of the venture funds, right? I think we moved from just sort of your classic um, venture funds to a whole slew of boutiques that have popped up who are focused, right, on 
women investing, and I think we're going to see the same thing, and we were already beginning to see it uh, investing in minorities. Yeah. Um, and I think they're going to be separated to begin with, just like we saw in many other professional service industries, um, women and minority owned firms. Right. And I think, you know, my dream is in the longer term that those two populations, again, get integrated, right, so that women and minorities become part of the mainstream in terms of both the venture investing and the entrepreneurs that they are investing in. Okay. We had an interesting uh, question pop up uh, here about reverse diversity, and I thought I'd get your comments. So the question is, reverse diversity is a new challenge where white or brown or males or seniors are facing discrimination. Do you have any thoughts and comments about that? Yeah, I think it's absolutely true. And I think that, you know, at this moment in time, it's really important for us to stand in solidarity with our black colleagues and friends and family and at the same time recognize that um, you know both that discrimination and other forms of discrimination against whether it's brown male seniors whites continues to exist and has existed and so not to diminish right the pain that folks have felt um, and, and and be conscious right of not creating a backlash um, while talking about these issues in the workplace. I think it's a very delicate balance and you know, the good chief diversity officer is able to bring everyone along in that journey together right. while recognizing the individual needs of the different parties at play. So I think it is an issue and I think that carefully managed, you know, we can in this country where, you know, we're comprised of immigrants from different places, um, you know, really acknowledge the needs of, of everyone, especially at this time of COVID when, you know, we're thinking about our seniors being at most risk and those who are in positions of needing to take care of elders, um, really making sure that they have what they need to be able to do so. Right. I think uh, that is definitely the, the, the name of the game when you talk about inclusion. It really is inclusion of everyone, uh, of all uh, ages, of all uh, predispositions, of all color, of all backgrounds, and of all functions, too. That's a great point you brought up where diversity on, in teams is not just devoted to the usual demographic type of information that we look at, but also um, about functionality as well. So you need people from engineering, you need people from business, you need people from the humanities, you need people of all backgrounds uh, and education and experience to really form um, a very great uh, framework from which the company can then go on to achieve greater success. Uh, that's a great takeaway right there. Uh, I think diversity happens on many, many different levels, not just the usual ones we think about. Um, exactly do you have right. any, any closing thoughts as we, as we wrap up this session? I know we've got an exciting panel coming up um, and I want to make sure we have enough time for that, but what are some other key takeaways that you would just like to leave our audience with? You know, I think that um, really uh, thinking about the fact that, you know, the, the Valley has been looking at this problem, I would say in a very focused way since 2015. Prior to that, you know, there was certainly talk about it with Sheryl Sandberg and others um, really leading the way. And I think it's time to take a hard look at, you know, why have the strategies that we've tried in the past not necessarily worked? Um, and really take a new approach to a journey that might require an investment for the longer term, um, but that will reap benefits um, as well for the longer term. And really having that kind of focus, I would say, um, through developing skills associated with inclusive leadership and the vernacular associated with that, um, that I think will make a difference here in Silicon Valley. And I'm excited as our panelists join us to <laughs> begin to turn, um, you know, to the next topic, which will be diversity on boards. Absolutely. Uh, this has been terrific, Tina. Thank you so much.